Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Protect Our Province COVID-19 briefing. We are live streaming from the traditional and ancestral territory of many peoples. We are grateful to live and work in Alberta, a province on the traditional territory of 48 different First Nations and the unceded homeland of the Métis Nation. Today's conversation is being shared in ASL. To ensure access to completely accurate information, closed captioning will be uploaded after the live stream is complete. This conversation for the public is being shared live on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. The Protect Our Province COVID-19 briefing is a regular panel of doctors and experts. We will endeavour to bring you timely, accurate updates on the COVID-19 situation in Alberta and take questions from the public and the media. The views of our panellists are their own and do not represent any institutions they may be affiliated with. We have collectively gathered here as concerned Albertans attempting to ensure that everyone in the province has access to as much information concerning COVID-19 in Alberta as possible. As always, we will start things off with an update on the COVID-19 situation in our province. Welcome back, everybody. Sorry for that muting. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. I am really looking forward to today's conversation. It is a topic in which I wish I had more information on. And after today, I know that I will. As we get going, as per usual, I'm going to bring up Dr. Vipond to take a look at COVID-19 in the province. Dr. Vipond. All right, let's go straight to the numbers. You can bring up my slides because we're going to save lots of room for the, um, the briefing today. So... Uh... We just got my slides there. Excellent. So um, I've kind of stopped given the graph of the cases per day. I just don't think it's a particularly useful stat anymore um, just because of the testing criteria changing. So I don't know. I can tell you that it's 49, uh, 34, 96, but I don't know what that means in the context of last week or next week or anything. So I've said the number, but it doesn't mean anything. The positivity probably does mean something, and you can see that the trend is flat. So this um, yesterday was 37.5%. Last Tuesday was 38.23%. And worth noting that we had a pandemic record yesterday or uh, Monday um, of around 43%. And so uh, you can see that spike on the graph. Um, next slide, please. And, and that's just to show the uh, how, how bad that is. So hospitalizations, yep, go ahead. Um, hospitalizations, uh, the thing I really want to point out, and you may seem that I've seen that I'm really pedantic when I'm revising the numbers all the time, um, but the, the numbers get revised up every single day. And so what I do is I go back about 10 days and I, and I, add, I, I look to see how that the numbers have changed over time. And if you look up until about the 17th of, of January on this graph, um, you can see that exponential curve going upwards, and then it kind of goes more on a linear uh, basis towards the 24th of January. I would suggest that that last section is not accurate because there's that curve is just going to go up and up and up over the next week as the numbers are revised. So we still have exponential growth. Um, you can see that there's a drop at the end there. That's not real. We'll, we'll see that that goes into the positive range over the next couple of days. And the most important thing uh, number, to, I think, to, to be aware of is the seven-day rise. Because of that change over time, I'm picking Friday, so like four days ago, as the comparison um, uh, day. So up, a seven-day rise from Friday to Friday, um, of last week was 34.6%. Um, so we still have ongoing um, uh, exponential growth. Um, the the rise the the day before was 38.4%. And it that number has been going down and down and down every day. So the rate of rise is decreasing with time, which is kind of good. But until it's actually dropping, I think we need to acknowledge that we're still in serious trouble. Um, so now we had a new pandemic record on Monday of 1303 uh, admitted inpatients, and, and that's a real big problem. Next slide, please. Um, that, I think that next slide should just be showing um, just the ex how, how much higher that inpatient rise is compared to previous, uh, previous waves. Next slide, please. On um, the ICU, the ICUs have been pretty flat over the week. Um, worth knowing that on the 24th of January, so Monday, we hit a, a, a pandemic wave, um, uh, new record of uh, 113. So um, that's a new um, 
uh, peak for this and then a, a drop over the last 24 hours and hopefully that won't be revised um, uh, downwards at all. Next slide, please. Um, I always like to talk about the pediatric uh, admissions. I just think it's worth pointing out because we keep being told that um, kids don't have severe disease. And as you can see here, um, we have uh, uh, a total of six, nine, 11 uh, new hospitalizations and one new ICU uh, admission. And in the United States right now, COVID is the number eight cause of death. So COVID is the number eight cause of death in the United States for this uh, so-called um, uh, mild illness. So next slide, please. These are the deaths in Alberta over the last, uh, um, reported in the last 24 hours, it's 22. Um, and uh, one under the age of 50. Um, this has been going up and up and up. Uh, I think 22 reported in a day must be a new record um, for this wave. Uh, and we've been averaging, like in the last week, I don't have this slide, but I'll put it in my Twitter um, feed. Um, we've been averaging somewhere around 13 to, to 15 deaths a day um, on date of death over the last week. And and that um, seems to continue to be rising. So we uh, continue to be in real trouble. Next slide, please. I just want to talk a little bit about Denmark. Denmark was in the news today because, because they've announced that on February 1st, so next Tuesday, um, all of their restrictions will be um, removed. This is currently the curve, the cases per day curve in, in Denmark. Um, it looks very, very exponential. Uh, one of the things that's happening in Denmark is a new variant, the BA2 or Super Omicron, as some people have called it, um, has taken hold and is now about 50% of the new cases. So it's kind of a combination of Omicron and, and this new BA2. Um, which is uh, seems to be driving this growth. It seems that BA2 is even more uh, transmissible than the, the original Omicron. Um, and we know that there are cases of these in Canada. And so let's just take a look at what's happening in, in, uh, in Denmark. Next slide, please. So I, it seems like the reason why that they've, uh, they've, they, they've decided to go um, let her rip in Denmark is this curve. This is the ICU curve. So you can see it's dropped precipitously over the last week. Um, not entirely sure why that is. Um, they are saying that it's, you know, that the standard decoupling between cases and severe disease. Um, so um, it's not entirely clear if maybe the BA2 just uh, will will change. We'll, we'll, we'll know more about BA2 over time. Next slide, please. And, but this is, I mean, really worrisome. This is the entire pandemic. You can see this graph is from April 2nd to January 25th. Um, and you can see that the inpatients, the, the actual hospitalized patients, is about to, to peak over their previous record. Um, and so this decoupling uh, may apply to intensive patients, but does not seem to be applying to, um, to inpatients, which is kind of what we're in um, here in Alberta as well. ICU not being as bad as before, but inpatients certainly uh, easily overwhelming our, our care system. Next slide, please. And uh, deaths per day still uh, on average rising week over week in Denmark. So they still haven't hit their peak deaths there. And that's despite Omicron being there. Denmark was one of the earliest countries to have Omicron. And so we need to watch all of these curves closely going forward because it may be um, foretelling our future. Um, you can get rid of the slides. Um, so today we're going to talk about testing. Um, it's now almost impossible to get a PCR test if you're a healthy, uh, healthy Albertan. So um, we're relying on wastewater testing to, to give us a, a, a view of what's happening on the ground. Um, the other thing that's happening is uh, rapid tests. And we, um, we, uh, Hopefully, we'll be getting more rapid tests available to Albertans. Um, so I know my kids brought some home from school last week. So just a couple of pointers on rapid tests. I know we've had how to do it on this uh, show before. Um, just a little bit about why and and what how to interpret it. So the first thing is is the uh, kind of pre Omicron, we were looking at it as a green light. So you can swab your nose, and if you test negative then you're okay to go and hang out with others. That means you're likely not an asymptomatic spreader. With Omicron, that's changed. And we're seeing a lot more false negatives with these early cases, especially the asymptomatic. And so it's become more of a red light tool rather than a green light tool. What does that mean as a red light tool? It means if you test yourself and you're 
and you're positive, you definitely should not be going out and associating with others. And that's most applicable if you start to have symptoms, that scratchy back of the throat, a runny nose, which we know that the, the Omicron tends to have more of those upper respiratory um, type symptoms. The other thing that we're learning about Omicron is that the sensitivity of the test is higher if you do both the mouth and the nose. And so that means getting in the back of the throat, you can rub it on the tongue in the side of the cheek along your teeth and between your, between your gums and the cheek, and then take that same swab and do both nostrils. And that will uh, increase the sensitivity of that swab. And we know that uh, we've got some good studies now that, that indicate that that's not just anecdotal data, that's actual real data. So those are my rapid test um, uh, advice to you. And I'm going to turn it back over to Michelle to, to launch uh, today's formal briefing. Thank you so very much, Dr. Vipond. It was great to see you. We will see you again tomorrow for our next national panel. I would like to jump right into our panel today. We're going to be taking a look at surveillance in Alberta as we continue to battle COVID-19. Previously, as Dr. Vipon had mentioned, we've dedicated time to rapid antigen testing, um, those at-home testing kits, as well as PCR testing that was previously available through the COVID-19 testing centers throughout the province and now offered to help assist in clinical treatment planning for some Albertans. But we've not had the opportunity to explore the larger scale surveillance that is happening at many wastewater treatment plants throughout Alberta, which is what we will be focusing today's briefing on. We're going to talk about poop. That's the plan. We're going to hear all about it. We're going to uncover how it works, why it works, what it actually tells us, as well as how to understand what the fancy little points on all of the various graphs are, because I know that sometimes I get confused. Not sometimes, all the time. Let's be honest, friends. If you're tuning in live and you have any questions as we go through today's briefing, please feel free to post your questions into the chat on YouTube, and we will do our best to facilitate some of the answers. I'm going to bring our two expert panelists into the conversation right now. That way we can meet them, and then we'll move into a presentation. Um, maybe starting with you, Dr. Parkins. Oh, I want to unmute you, but I can't. It needs you to unmute yourself. Perfect. Would you be willing to introduce yourself to our folks at home? And then we'll move over to you, Dr. Chu. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Mike Parkins. I'm an infectious disease specialist here in uh, University of Calgary, where I'm an associate professor in the Department of Medicine uh, and Microbiology, Immunology and Infectious Disease. I'm one of uh, uh, Calgary's wastewater uh, COVID-19 surveillance leads, and I partner with uh, Lily Pang and Benita Lee uh, for the University of Alberta in Edmonton. Thank you so very much for that robust introduction. And Dr. Chu, how about you? Um, thank you. Uh, I'm actually just here to ask some questions of Dr. Parkins. Um, I'm a uh, sewage researcher from the University of Calgary. And uh, I just actually saw his, uh, his presentation. I've been looking at a bunch of data from across Canada and uh, I'm hoping to get into a good discussion as to the uh, uh, efficacy of this, uh, of this method. Brilliant. This is wonderful. Thank you both so very much for being here. Um, Dr. Chu, I'm going to pop you backstage for a moment. And Dr. Parkins, I am going to hand things over to you to spend some time talking us through how this type of surveillance works and how folks at home can utilize this data in their region to monitor levels of COVID-19 close to their home. Thank you. Um, all right. So, uh, uh, again, I've already acknowledged that uh, um, I'm one of several uh, wastewater experts uh, pursuing COVID-19 modeling within uh, Calgary and uh, Alberta at large. What's important is most of us uh, at the start of the pandemic did not have uh, the skill set to do this all on our own. And we partnered in Calgary with members of the faculties of science, engineering and medicine, um, and more recently bioinformatics to be able to uh, rapidly develop this technology and apply it to a real world situation. This is science in action. Next slide, please. Um, so what is wastewater based epidemiology? Well, it's a field. Oh, it's a field of science that analyzes analytes in population, different chemicals, different molecular signatures in order to better understand the population at large that uh, contributes to the wastewater. Uh, so it, the analogy is drawing blood from a host to understand the health of the human host by looking at blood. The difference from a human person 
uh, to a wastewater network is within the wastewater network, you can move in on a more and more granular scale by sampling um, strategically through the nodal network of sewer sheds. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what's most important about uh, wastewater-based epidemiology is it's a comprehensive technology capturing all members of society that contribute to the wastewater network and by its very nature is inclusive and does not exclude um, marginalized populations. It captures everybody in the society and it is an objective unbiased mechanism by which to measure the burden of each particular analyte in a population. Next slide please. So why COVID-19 um, modeling through wastewater? Well the very fact is that SARS-CoV-2 RNA, remnants of the virus, are shed into the feces of infected individuals. And by uh, measuring wastewater from communities, we can look at the burden of RNA remnants in the wastewater to understand how it correlates with clinical cases. Uh, what's important is wastewater captures everybody with COVID-19, those with symptoms and those without, um, and those who can get tested and those who cannot. Uh, again, the adage, everyone poops, and with wastewater-based epidemiology, we can capture all of this and understand the dynamics in a population. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a quick workflow of how we do the um, wastewater analysis in Calgary. It's a little bit different in every other site, um, which is uh, the result of each group developing sample uh, processing methodologies in real time. and a limited uh, supply chain in terms of getting access. So we all had to figure things out on our own and validate different steps. Um, next slide. Uh, sample collection is obviously the first step. And what we uh, rely on is the collection of composite wastewater. Uh, composite wastewater uh, allows for the continuous collection of small amounts of wastewater through a 24 hour cycle, recognizing that most individuals um, have a diurnal pattern of water usage um, and toileting pattern. So to understand an entire population, we wanna capture that entire 24 hour period. The program I'm gonna to talk to you about right now is our wastewater monitoring program, specifically at wastewater treatment plants through large municipalities in Alberta. But we have wastewater monitoring programs in hospitals, uh, all major hospitals in Calgary, uh, and increasingly a couple in Edmonton. Uh, we've had them in schools, we've had them in campuses and dorms, correctional facilities, shelters. Uh, we've been through the sewer shed in Calgary, uh, looking at up to eight different uh, neighborhoods, capturing about 24% of the population um, and in um, First Nations communities. And for each of these sampling strategies, we use a different type of auto sampler, whether it's this large industrial one that you'll see that's that tube being lowered into a manhole or a small uh, pelican case type uh, device that's been designed for in-facility monitoring by a local Alberta company, CEC Analytics. Next slide, please. Uh, once samples are collected, uh, we rely on um, uh, a logistic network that exists through um, standard uh, transport companies to get samples to us here in Calgary in rapid time on ice such that there's no sample degradation. And then we use what's called a 4S mechanism by which to um, purify the wastewater sample of impurities uh, and remove factors that inhibit molecular signature detection uh, and to concentrate the wastewater. We spike each sample with an internal control so we can look to see if there are inhibitors present. And we can also look at other factors within the wastewater to try and normalize that signal although increasingly we find that uh, efforts to normalize don't actually correlate better with outcomes. Next slide, please. Uh, we look at a number of molecular targets. Uh, we look at two regions within the nucleocapsid gene of uh, SARS-CoV-2, N1 and N2. This would be similar to looking at a left sock and a right sock. Uh, in the past, we've looked at the envelope gene, although it's less sensitive. Um, the agent that we spike into our wastewater that we then measure is the uh, uh, bovine coronavirus, which is a vaccine that we can use. And we, again, use that as an internal control to make sure that there's no inhibitors present. Um, and other internal controls intrinsic to those samples, including the pepper mild model virus, as well as a few other bacterial factors that 
in theory, allow us to correlate back to fecal burden in wastewater. In practice, that seems to be less so. But again, this is science in action. Next slide, please. Um, and then we go through a process of uh, data reporting uh, and where that act, uh, data is actioned. So um, below, uh, the screen capture here uh, is of the CSM uh, COVID tracker uh, produced through the Center for Health Informatics here at the University of Calgary, courtesy of Tyler Williamson and his group. And if you click on that, it should take us to the website in real time. Not sure if you can click on that link there, uh, Michelle. Maybe Chad, not. Chad, well, I, can, I can't, but Chad probably can. But if not, I actually also happen to have the website up as well. Because, oh, there we go. Chad made it happen because I was going to ask you a couple questions about it myself. Um, okay. There you go. Click on that top box there. And then the wastewater tab, it's the fourth one over. All right, and so here we see uh, a schematic uh, for uh, the city of Calgary. Um, you can see underneath the map that Calgary really has three wastewater treatment plants. It's the only uh, municipality in Alberta that is serviced by three wastewater treatment plants. Uh, one in the north uh, and two in the south that share the combined minority of wastewater in the city of Calgary. We, by flow weighting, uh, the signal that we measure at each site based on the amount of flow of wastewater that's received at each site, we can come up with a, a single composite value. And what you can see here is the N1 value reported over time through the second, third, fourth, and now a massive fifth wave of COVID-19, which you can see we're on the downward trend of, and that's been consistent for a significant period of time. You can see by moving over to the top left, that what's reported here is N1. And if you click, you can go to N2. And this is measuring your left sock and your right sock and see that they uh, correlate very strongly or an average of the two. Um, and then you can see we're reporting uh, the rolling average, which is a, a new method by which we've tried to display the data to try and remove focus on any individual data point, but rather to understand um, trends over time because recognizing Wastewater is a terribly complex and heterogeneous matrix, uh, and there is bound to be sample to sample variation. So if you go to exact, you'll see it, it bounces around a little bit more and looks a little more sawtooth. So this is Calgary. You can click on Edmonton next, and you'll see that um, Edmonton has had, a, uh, if we click on rolling average again as well, just to be consistent between them, you can see that the second, third, fourth, uh, and fifth wave. And, Edmonton seems to be declining at even faster rate than what we've observed in Calgary. Uh, the decline is certainly encouraging. It's been consistent over time at large municipalities, but smaller centers. So if you click over on Drumheller, you'll see that that's not occurring. Okotoks and Lethbridge, you'll see that um, different period, different places uh, uh, across the province are at different periods within the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Large cities peaked faster and are starting to decline faster. In the smaller centers, that trend is slower. So again, um, what we're seeing is a, a consistent trend in larger centers towards declining COVID-19 uh, uh, community cases as measured by SARS-CoV-2 wastewater RNA. Next slide, please. Um, what we've been able to do is correlate our wastewater values with clinically diagnosed cases. And, and this is the city of Calgary. Um, we've looked at this across uh, municipalities and generally our, uh, our squared correlation is between 0.85 and 0.89. So it's a very strong correlation between wastewater diagnosed cases, or um, sorry, wastewater diagnosed predicted cases, and those are clinically observed using um, cases are reported to Alberta Health Services in a rolling five-day average. So what we've seen here, um, or what we've plotted here, are those cases that are reported to Alberta Health Services in blue. And you can see that through the second, third, fourth, and fifth wave. And what you can see here in red 
are the top 95% and bottom 95% bands of what we would predict the number of cases to be that are benchmarked against Alberta Health Services diagnosed cases. And what's important is that wastewater provides a leading indicator to cases. So wastewater best correlates with cases that are to be diagnosed six days in the future. So here, the wastewater that's been collected is used to predict those cases that are occurring six days in the future and are measured against that. And you can see we've had very strong correlations through waves two, three, four, where it started to have uh, um, uh, fewer clinically diagnosed cases and, and wave five here as well. Um, so again, we see a very strong correlation over time and why this technology is so important at a time in which we have um, a lot more cases, limited access to um, confirm PCR-based uh, testing and more reliance on rapid tests and not a mechanism by which to capture those as well and, and accurately. So wastewater certainly now is the gold standard by which to measure COVID-19 community burden um, and probably has been all along. Importantly, our benchmark has always been against confirmed clinical cases and those have never captured all cases in a population. Next slide, please. Um, we can detect uh, uh, changes in Omicron prevalence over time looking at wastewater. So here's um, a, a quick uh, presentation of how we've done that here using a drop qPCR assay where we look for um, a specific uh, mutation associated with the deletion that's present in the Omicron variant and not present in Delta. Um, and we can see how the proportion of Omicron to Delta changed very rapidly across municipalities uh, through mid-December, uh, occurring first uh, in Calgary um, and Banff and later in other areas of Alberta, including um, Edmonton, which followed slightly later, but it's been the smaller communities that have been taken a, a longer time to change over to Omicron. Uh, this isn't always possible. Uh, following the change from Alpha uh, to uh, uh, Delta was, was a challenge and we weren't able to do it just based on the molecular biology of the, the viruses. Next slide, please. Um, our team in Calgary is massive. My two co-leads are Kevin Frankowski on the left, uh, Casey Hubert in the middle. Um, and then we've got uh, the rest of our entire team, including towards the bottom, our Center for Health Informatics, the folks that post the data in real time and help us to make it uh, usable to the public, as well as our Alberta health funders and partners. Um, and then my colleagues uh, at the University of Alberta at the very bottom, Lily Pang, Benita Lee, and Steve Rudy. That's it for my formal presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so very much, Dr. Parkins. Um, I have many questions that have come in from folks at home, as well as ones that I thought about before we had this conversation. But I'm going to bring Dr. Chu in as well. Hello again, Dr. Chu. Um, any thoughts or things that you wanted to add? Or questions that you had as you expressed having a couple of questions. Oh, and you are muted, my dear. And I... Okay. Perfect. Now, that was a really excellent uh, presentation on the, the current state of the uh, state of the art on um, what you guys have been doing uh, very quickly. Uh, maybe I'll... I'll why don't we uh, start, and then I'll uh, I'll chime in uh, when I feel uh, when I feel I need to. I would love that. Yeah. Thank you so very much. Um, as always, we will aim to keep this discussion conversational and try to tackle as many questions as we can from the media and folks at home. So feel free, panelists, just to unmute or mute yourself as I race through some of them because we do have a lot as inspiration strikes you. Um, and uh, Dr. Chu, uh, uh, my colleague, C. Hubert, so he's the uh, another co-lead here. He tells me you were his thesis examiner back in the day. So... Uh, uh, yeah, I was, you know, I, I, I was part of your group until uh, it got too big, eh? Yeah. And then I kind of, uh, it got I don't think my picture would be on there. <laughs> I, but I see Steve Rudy's picture on there. Yeah, Steve's been a big help. We uh, uh, talk with Steve weekly here. Yeah, the uh, the, the data you showed is, uh, I think I he showed it to one time. That was the data I wanted to talk about, but uh, mm -hmm. it might be uh, getting into the weeds a bit. Uh, that's why I was kind of thinking, 
well, maybe if uh, if I need to, let's get into the weeds. But uh, sure. I expect there's a lot of other uh, more pressing concerns. Well, I can definitely throw out a few of the initial questions that have been coming in, and then we can see how deep into the science our folks at home want to go and see what happens. Um, we've had multiple questions around what percentage of the population is on monitored wastewater versus those who in our province are on septic systems and more remote rural areas that don't have the same type of treatment plants. I know, yeah. I know the answer to that really well, unless you want to undertake that, Michael. Sure, go ahead, Angus. Um, so I've been working on the, it's called the uh, on-site wastewater industry. And it services about 20% of the population of Alberta. So none of this kind of, um, I guess, sampling would cover uh, septic systems. For there, you would have to go to the individual households to collect your samples. Um, but I haven't done it other than for the research that I do, right? Which is septic systems and that type of thing. Uh, but yeah, not like the sample I, for a COVID-19 uh, COVID uh, determination. So we've tr uh, tried to target every municipality um, close to about 8,000 and down to about 6,500 individuals uh, for inclusion in the program. Um, and with a few rare exceptions, every community was uh, keen to come on board. And uh, uh, we even have uh, another community joining us next week, which is Edson. Uh, right now, um, we cover more than 75% of Alberta's population through the wastewater treatment, uh, wastewater treatment plant monitoring programs. Um, we notably don't cover very small communities um, and yeah. our... Uh, assessments of uh, uh, First Nations communities are really quite limited right now to pilot programs, and we don't share those types of data publicly. Do you do uh, lagoons and uh, or just uh, sort of mechanical activated sludge type? We're starting to explore. Yeah. So okay. Again, we, we focused uh, from a municipal perspective on wastewater treatment plants, but we're starting to explore smaller and smaller catchments. Yeah, you do realize that the, uh, I think the, the, it's about 96% of all uh, sort of remote sewage treatment systems out there are lagoons. Yeah. Like there are, uh, there are very few sewage treatment plants out there. They're mostly- In the small, small places, that's true. Yeah, yeah, all around, you'll just, you'll find them everywhere, basically. In every town and every small village, there's, there's lagoons that treat, uh, treat their wastewater. So you know, yeah, for, yeah. It, it's a it, it seems like a really interesting. Uh, uh, what was Jon Snow? Um, not the one on Game of Thrones. The other Jon Snow that did uh, the cholera outbreak and uh, epidemiologist. Mm -hmm. These would be really interesting epidemiological studies. I think a lot of the data is kind of there. Uh, oh yeah. In terms of testing and stuff, right? But uh, but I'd like I like to go down this this road a little bit if I could, because that's one of my areas of interest. Is uh, how you measure very specific things in a dirty matrix like sewage effluent. Um, well, there, there's lots of different techniques that can yeah. be done. Um, so we use. Uh, um, uh, a technique called the 4S mechanism. And again, we, we capture uh, on average between two and seven liters from each of the wastewater treatment plants, ship it on ice. Raw sewage or, or, or filtered sewage or just? It's raw sewage. Yeah, so it's yeah. got chunks and stuff in it, eh? It's got chunks, yeah. And we, hum yeah. Uh, we, we, we mix it well um, and then do a subsampling by which we can purify. Do you use, um, a, wear do you use a wearing blender? No. Yeah, maybe you should use a wearing blender. You know what a wearing blender is? Um, I, I don't, but I'm sure my partner at Aqua does. Yeah, What's it's important uh, in, in wastewater, though, is, is not so much um, developing the most effective mechanism, but rather consistency, such that you can uh, in, ensure that you're comparing apples to apples throughout the sampling that's why, process. You know, I've, been doing, uh, I've been doing sludge for 30 years, and wearing blenders are the makes a nice, nice, smooth smoothie. 
Right. I'm glad that I prefaced all of this today with yeah. the fact that we were going to be enjoying talking about poop as now yeah. I know that there are sludge blenders out there and I'm pretty excited to go have a look. <laughs> this is what's hanging on my wall in my office. <laughs> oh, it's delightful. Um, she's, there's oh, yeah. a lot of little poops, a lot of little poops. The spirituality of uh, sewage and sludge is uh, notorious. I mean, I, I commend you for tackling this uh, I guess a timely subject and a really excellent research program, but it's quite a, uh, I think uh, it, it, it's probably been a challenge and, and the, and the matrix makes it an incredible challenge. It, it does. What data. we have found is less than 3% of samples are subject to inhibition though. Um, so, which is great. Meaning our results are, um, rarely do we have to throw out a sample because we think its results are unreliable. We're quite content with our, our results each time. Um, in addition to monitoring SARS-CoV-2, we have assays that we've developed to look for other respiratory viruses. Uh, it's really important moving forward that we understand the respiratory illnesses that people are experiencing. It's, it's not going to be sufficient to know that this is COVID-19 or not. We want to know what this is, particularly as their uh, um, uh, infectious illnesses do have treatments that can help to, to mitigate their um, um, ultimate response, including things like influenza. So we're working to onboard those assays over time. We're also looking at antibiotic resistance, gene determinants um, at individual facilities and uh, across the province on a pilot basis. And of course, the other area that's a, a great topical interest right now is monitoring for substances of misuse, um, so drugs. And uh, um, we're hoping to develop a pilot program there. While we still have our Alberta Health-funded uh, COVID-19 monitoring program, because much of the cost of uh, sample analysis is associated with collection and transport. And uh, right now, that's about 65 or 70 percent of uh, the cost of doing that type of work, and we've already got money to do that with COVID-19. So we're hoping to get some pilot funds to better understand uh, how uh, uh, drug use changes uh, across time and in different communities of Alberta. It would provide uh, important information in terms of mobilizing resources to to get them closer to people in the communities. So, so I take it we'll get a warning next time. Uh... A six-day warning. Is that what you're? Yes. You're, yeah. So uh, again, wastewater is nice because it provides a leading indicator. So um, with the declining levels that we're observing through the major municipalities in Alberta right now, um, that tells us cases are going to be falling uh, six days in the future from when that sample was collected. So things are um, uh, moving in the right direction, but it's really important to highlight that uh, even though we've seen this strong drop uh, that uh, SARS-CoV-2 values in wastewater now are still higher than they were at any wave before, one, two, three, or four. So even though things are finally starting to look better, they're still worse than they ever were before. I am immensely enjoying the fact that you guys are just going through my list of questions without having my list of questions or access to the questions that are coming through on the various social platforms. So thank you very much for keeping the conversational tone that I love. One of the questions that we've gotten a fair bit of is you talked a little bit, Dr. Parkins, about um, being able to use the S gene um, to sort of see that difference between when you went into Delta and Omicron with Omicron B2, BA2 appearing, as well as the potential always of other new variants. Is Are you using any of the samples to do more significant PCR style type testing in terms of gene mapping what you're finding in there as well? So we can be watching for differences that might be occurring in people's poop? We, we have on an exploratory basis done metagenomic work. Um, our group uh, is, well, while we have lots of experience in doing this, uh, we're not as well resourced as some areas. Uh, the problem with that type of work is it's very expensive and it's slow. So it's not providing real-time information. Um, it's only by developing uh, variant-specific qPCR assays do we have the potential to get real-time information. And we've been lucky with this last wave that we've been able to do that. Um, it's much easier to understand emerging variants by using a single patient sample, which is free of uh, uh, molecular inhibitors and a single virus at a point in time. 
What is a molecular inhibitor? There's lots and lots of things that interfere with RNA analysis in the in wastewater. So just it something is, that interferes with the way you can analyze absolutely. people. Poop? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. There's oftentimes that sort of um, verbiage that becomes second nature to us in our specific industries that then I'm like, okay, I think this is what you're saying. But if I'm questioning in my brain, I suspect someone is questioning in their brain at home. Um, a couple of the questions that we got from Twitter earlier today um, were asking around whether or not either of you are aware of any rapid type tests that are in development or have been developed for people to test their poop at home as opposed to doing traditional rats with the swab. I'm not sure how much people would like testing um, their own excrement, but some people I think would test their own excrement at home. Yeah, that's a, a bit of a, a loaded question. I mean, the antigen test um, looks for the antigen regardless of where it comes from, whether it's a a respiratory or a rectal sample, uh, but they haven't necessarily been validated in that uh, mechanism. Um, certainly the approach that Dr. Vipon suggested in terms of doing a full swab and then a nasal swab, uh, if you were gonna include rectal, you wanna make sure you got the order right. <laughs> Uh, I'm yes. not saying do that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There are some jurisdictions that are doing um, rectal PCR testing, though, throughout the globe, are there not? Y yes, there is. And there's some evidence to say that it may be more sensitive, but it depends on the patient population. Another it's certainly harder to do. We're learning a lot. We've learned a lot over the last two years. We'll have an entire population of Albertans who are comfortable swabbing themselves Um in various orifices by the time this is done. I hope people are very responsible. I like it, whatever works. Um, when we are between waves, how do you, I'm just trying to read this question that has been sent. Um, I think you answered it already because it was the six day question. So based on the charts that you were showing us where you were mapping um, clinically confirmed cases as well as percentage positivity, as well as what you were seeing in the wastewater, wastewater itself, um, it looked like it was exceptionally successful in terms of lining those up with your 95th percentile and whatnot. Does it change going forward now that we have less um, patient-specific in-community testing happening? So will you change that sort of charting matrix that you guys use to validate the continued um, displaying of sort of that six days of a leading indicator? Yeah, th there's lots of factors that are going to influence that we don't really understand going forward. So again, does the Omicron virus shed at a different rate in the uh, feces relative to other variants that we've seen before in an increasingly immune population? Um, are they going to shed less virus than a non-immune population? Um, so all these factors are things that we need to understand moving forward. One of the questions that had come up briefly while you were speaking about pilot projects going forward, as well as when we were talking about overall epidemiology, as well as Dr. Chu had mentioned in terms of cholera epidemics throughout the globe and outbreaks, um, what types of future applications do you guys see as a potential for this style of surveillance. So we did talk a little bit in terms of substance use, um, but epidemiologically speaking and disease speaking, you'd mentioned respiratory illnesses, any other mm, robust ways that this type of continued work could lead to future awesomeness for our global population? Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe I'll just start though. From a, a public health perspective, there's many, many, many different targets, uh, and they're really dependent on whether they're excreted in urine or feces. So feces, of course, it's bacteria and antibiotic resistant organisms. Um, many respiratory viruses that infect the respiratory tract will also infect the GI tract, or we may, we may, may swallow bits of them such that we can monitor them. And then there are some things that are shed in the urine that are very different, particularly things like measles, mumps, and rubella, which would be highly amenable. And then drugs. Um, so we talked about uh, our classical drugs or uh, substances of misuse, but antibiotic use, all kinds of other things. Uh, what we do is uh, work with a platform technology that we've adapted specifically for SARS-CoV-2 
but its potential is is near unlimited. And I, I think Dr. Chu's probably spent a lot more time looking at other potential uh, um, applications of this platform technology. Do you want me to say something or? If you feel like it. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, the, uh, I think the, the data that I've seen, it, uh, it wasn't conclusive to me that it showed, um, like I'm talking about the raw data that it, that it showed that you had a six day, um, prediction now. Yeah, so I'm not showing that. that just talking we, about we, that. Uh, yeah, that's yeah how, how, well are you, how are you concluded that that? Yeah. So what we do is we look at how the cases the, the case occurrences occur uh, in relation to when that sample was collected. And when we look at the arc over time, it's um, and at, between different sites, it's between six and ten days. And in Alberta, at each of our sites, it's six days where the, the correlation is strongest. Um, what you need to understand is people will shed SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA for a period of time with COVID-19 illness. What we don't necessarily understand particularly well is the dynamics. How quickly does it peak and how quickly does it fall? But by monitoring individual sites, we've been able to learn a lot. So hospitals, we went in there really to um, develop this technology and get a positive signal at a time at the trough of wave one where we really didn't have much community COVID-19. Um, and we ended up staying because we observed some really interesting things. In hospitals, despite dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of people being admitted with community acquired disease from which they were resolving, where we could detect SARS-CoV-2 levels increase in proportion to the number of patients admitted, if there were clusters of nosocomial transmission or even outbreaks of one or two people, we could still detect that through massive spikes in the SARS-CoV-2 RNA levels, telling us that the bulk of shedding happens right when people are symptomatic or just before, um, which tells us this is when we really want the virus to be shedding where we want to be detected. Because we don't really, we're not as concerned about people who are recovering from illness in the community. We want to know people who are experiencing brand new onset illness. And uh, so how often would you be uh, sampling the effluent? or the sewage, the raw sewage. Like, in hospitals, we do it three times a week. Three times. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, I think uh, the, I haven't seen that level of granularity in the data sets that I've looked at. Um, but yeah, if they could fill out the, the, the data sets that I've looked at are all kind of just, yeah, they correlate, but they, they look like noise too. Yeah, that's why you need to go into different areas. So the hospitals uh, have been really helpful. We've gone into areas that haven't been quite as helpful. So we've looked to try and identify SARS-CoV-2 in schools. Um, and uh, we did a pilot program uh, and we're monitoring for uh, uh, about 12 weeks across five schools. And uh, um, in elementary schools, we found that there was uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater and it correlated with new cases. Uh, but again, the proportion of children that were pooping at school was small and we didn't um, capture every case because that was a limitation. Right. Um, and in junior highs and elementaries, uh, wastewater was near void of any solid material and we didn't detect any SARS-CoV-2 telling us, um, as most of our older children would tell us, they don't poop at school. Right, right. <laughs> I love it. I, that's exactly what I was thinking. So I'm glad you brought it up because I was going to pop in and be like, how do we feel people's regular bowel movement schedules work into the sampling that you're doing? So thank you so very much for um, addressing that. Um, Dr. Chu, I wouldn't mind going back to the question that we had started this little section on because I would love to have your thoughts because your um extreme body of work in terms of research and what can be done with sampling of wastewater is um, very impressive when I was looking through some of the studies that you had conducted. Hmm. What do you see as the future for this type of technology? So even just beyond 
what has happened over the last couple of years, which has been unique as a human who is not part of this world to discover little bits of how much we can discover about humanity through our excrement. Um, but yeah, going forward, what do you think are some of the, you know, possibilities with our waste? Um, well, it, de it all depends on what you want me to talk about. Uh, there's, there's two, two main things. There's the, there's the technology, the, the quantitative PCR technology that has very much more broad application to just sewage or there's the, 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 the sewage thing, because I think that the, the molecular techniques that are being utilized in this study are, um, are useful techniques that should be, uh, promulgated and supported because it gives you novel answers to what otherwise would be uh, a lot of times guesses when it comes to uh, when, what type of uh, implementation of a regulatory rule is or mass mandates, you kind of want uh, the only, the only downside I see to this potentially is that it will be just another line of evidence uh, and not kind of the silver bullet, if you know what I mean, Michael, because at this point, it's sort of like, it looks like it'll work, but the acid test is whether it will predict the next spike. Yeah, uh, I mean, you're using data. Yeah. You're using you're using the whole data set, right? And you're saying, okay, we you can do it, but can you do it? Yeah, I, I mean, so the idea is right now we're looking at a limited number of targets. Um, if there are mutations within the target genes that we are currently looking at, we might not be able to detect them with the molecular tools and one or N2, or our E gene, or some of the others that we're experimenting with, but some of them will work. But you'll, you'll, um, have, to, you'll have to choose new ones, I suspect, right? Or, well, or it's little, possible. Um, Again, yeah. um, we, we've been through five waves and haven't seen any signal degradation. Um, e each variant uh, works very well within the assays that we use. Um, what the future will work, and you'll have to be a little this, careful with. This other question on uh, what exactly are you measuring to determine the variants are you measuring different uh parts or are you you must be yeah or so we have yeah okay, we have yeah variant specific pcr assays but again we are doing whole genome sequencing of uh the, the rna fragments that we receive in wastewater it's just you sequence a lot of non-covid material in wastewater it's obviously very 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 messy there's a lot um, of DNA, because there's a lot of dna in wastewater yeah absolutely <laughs> okay, so what's the most interesting non-SARS-CoV-2 thing you have found that you what? are able to share with us? I would love to know from both of your guys' lifetime of experience, what is the most unique thing that you have uncovered in um, analyzing on a molecular level waste? Um, well, we, we see a number of RNA viruses in, in wastewater. Um, but again, our interest is looking for those that are causing disease. So we're onboarding all kinds of new assays to look for things like RSV and influenza and parainfluenza. Problem being, COVID-19 restrictive measures have reduced the burden of all these in the community as well. So it's, it's pretty hard to look for them right now. We do have assays that will work. Um, again, the bottom line, COVID-19 wastewater-based monitoring is a really important tool for understanding the community burden but it's one tool within many. Um, it doesn't replace clinical testing, which is very important, um, particularly again, for um, understanding specific details about one person's virus to understand its uh, uh, implications. We are definitely advocates for a robust response for understanding. Um, one of the main principles of POP Alberta is working towards transparency as well as deepening folks' understanding. That way they can be navigating their own 
risk, not just for themselves, but for the communities in which they reside. Um, before we end up moving into our saying goodbye for today, as somehow we have already reached it to the end of an hour, which always seems to happen, um, as just a regular human, I'm a regular human. Thank you. Can I, can I, oh, uh, yeah, please. Can I say my two cents? Please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you know, I think this this study was a really good example of the of all the molecular methods that have been uh, uh, invented to be able to kind of uh, answer some of these uh, fundamental questions, which is, I think, a good thing that we need to do. But it also comes with all the other, I don't know if I would call them good things. They're good things in the sense that we use uh, this thing called agrobacterium tumefaciens to make uh, this uh, Roundup Ready canola. You know, it's the same technology, right? It's, uh, it's transforming a canola to be resistant to Roundup using all the same methods and that's increased our productivity um, quite dra dramatically. All of this kind of uh, molecular, um, what would you call your area of, uh, of practice? Is it, uh, do you call it molecular engineering or, or is it uh, molecular biology or? Yeah. Uh, well, we're not engineering, or, we're not creating. Okay. We're, we're just monitoring so it's just uh, molecular quantification yeah but yeah um, not driven by science it's sort of driven by uh, economy especially all of these uh all of these uh, methods that we use to uh to generate uh better crop yields in addition to all the other, uh, um, I don't know what I would call it, genetic engineering, um, that actually transform uh, genes into other species. So, sort of those types of things all come with uh, with this uh, with this arsenal that we have, eh? Uh, the toolkit. Um, so, you know what? I, I think it's. Um, I'd like to see whether it would predict the next, um, what would you call it? It's a, it's now on its uh, fifth, uh, what were you calling it? Uh, a spike or a, a wave? The, the fifth wave, yes. Yeah, now, well, yeah, let's see what the sixth wave looks like. And I'm, ho I'm hoping you would, uh, you may come back on this program and say that you guys have succeeded in predicting that wave by six days. That'd be that that'd be that'd be good. That's all I have to say. It was perfect, Dr. Chu, because yeah. that was actually going to be my sort of closing um oh, question. Oh, it was brilliant. I love it. What I wanted to ask was as a human, um, regular human, um, if I am continuing to monitor the um CHI website, which I was pre, like before when it was just Calgary, just Calgary. Um, what, how many data points am I looking for in my specific community to be like, yes, that is definitely a bit of a rise um, that I want to be concerned about versus a few extra people went to the bathroom over that three day period. So can can I can I answer that question because I got a good answer answer for that question because I deal with data we call it time series data this, these are this is data that's affected by time so you can't do it's not normally distributed data so time affects it and these are things like rate increases and rate decreases right when something goes up and down and up and down as you're measuring it, you almost think that's noise. But when something goes up all the time or it goes down all the time, that gives you a very much stronger uh, ability to conclude that that data is real data and not just 
uh, an artifact of whatever you're using to measure. And um, I guess, I don't know if this is a criticism of molecular biology, but this, uh, so I've done uh, qPCR and sometimes it's the quantitative part of it is really terrible. It doesn't really give you a, gra a, gra gra a gradation of, of good quantification the 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 it, it, because these things are rely on uh this thing called um it's a thermocycler they were getting to the weeds on this but it 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 every it, it's two to the end times you got to think about how things expand in terms of copy number you know how you how you how you how you um what's the term i, I don't i don't use these terms much michael they're uh what does a PCR do? It uh, amplifies, right? It's it's a thermocycler. So yeah, uh, again, every time it amplifies, it's double the amount of product that you have in the well. So you run. I don't know how many cycles you run, Michael. Maybe twenty. So we, we run forty-five, but 45 uh, cycles. Uh, anything beyond forty is considered negative. So if you start with one copy at the end of forty-five cycles, what's the number, Michael? I don't know. It's a again, lot. It's all based on the uh, standard curve that you develop. Yeah, but it's right, so everything is referenced back to a standard curve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that just that um, that effector of the PCR machines, you have to kind of figure out how to remove that effect, the amplification, because you're just you're making tons more product to the point where you can actually detect it, right? That's the whole secret of PCR is you take something that's like one or two copies or how, you know, very few copies, you never did, you know, you're not able to detect it. But if you amplify the copy number, you can detect that, uh, you can detect that signal. And so then with it being over time, as a human, I'm watching for that curve to keep going up or to keep going down and I'm paying yeah. less attention to yeah. big spikes and drops Yeah, but, um, I, because I, those I, could be noise in terms of only two people chose to poo that day or, <laughs> but yeah. when we are seeing that sort of consistent pattern of those copies appearing within the waste, then yeah. as a human looking at the CHI homepage and interface, I can be yeah. extra precautionary with switching to my N99 or my N95 versus being a little bit freer in terms of how many people I want to kiss that day. Yeah, bottom line, um, three readings in a row provide a very good indication in terms of trends. So um, we, we pay attention to one, but we don't get too excited. Two, we start to feel a little bit more confident. We know the, the direction things are heading. And by the time we've had three in a row, we're feeling really confident. And we developed that over two years of experience looking at this matrix for this target. So you're saying three in a row uh, with, was it three, three samples a week? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both so very much. Um, for anybody watching live right now, um, in the chat, Chad is going to pop up the link again for the covidtracker.chi-csm.ca. It will also go out on our Twitter feed and we will make sure to post it in the YouTube comments afterwards. Um, that way you can do some wastewater monitoring of your own at home. Um, follow along with the project as it's ongoing. Um, Dr. Parkins, one quick last question, if you are allowed to say, how long are you guys currently able to, with like the funding structure that you have in place, continue to monitor the waste? Uh, we'll be monitoring until June. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So we will see, Dr. Chu. I'll have you guys back. Ideally, we won't hit a sixth but who knows, I'm knocking on wood. Um, we will see if we do hit that six wave. Um, I'd love to have you both back on to see how, um, how, you, how well you stayed in the current curve. Um, yes, thank you both. Say hello to Casey for me. I will, Angus. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. I thank give, you. I gave him a hard time on his uh, thesis defense too, eh? <laughs>
<laughs> Poor Casey may or may not be watching live, may or may not watch later. And we'll have to have Casey on too. Um, that way we can have a conversation on their dissertation and um, see how that went from their side too. Thank you both All so right, thanks, very buddy. much. Um, as always, um, my friends, this topic was way too large to discuss in an hour. So thank you rem for remaining with us until 10 after the hour. Um, we'll be back tomorrow with a panel of experts from coast to coast to coast with another look at COVID-19 across the country. Um, tomorrow's focus is going to be specifically geared towards the prairie provinces. We will have special guests from Manitoba and Saskatchewan joining us to look at what has been happening on that center to east of the Rockies go that way as always stay safe alberta remember covid19 is airborne wear the best mask with the securest fit you have access to and vaccines really are still saving lives <laughs> <laughs>